Guys, this is Dr. Mobeen Sayed from drbean.com. So we have uh, we've been talking about COVID for some time, and one important topic that many people had been sending me messages for was the azithromy azithromycin. So we all know that uh, there has been that initial study that came out that hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin plus zinc had shown very good results. And I'm now seeing that there are so many countries where they've removed the hydroxychloroquine because WHO said so, and they've been just using azithromax or azithromycin. Although I believe that the right combination is still HCQ with azithromycin plus uh, zinc. Although there is one more disclaimer here that both the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin can prolong QT interval. So folks who are uh, who have a heart issue, they should not take this combination or should take only with their doctor's advice. So with this, today what I wanted to do was I wanted to go over the mechanism of action of azithromycin so we can complete this package of what this is. And uh, many, many folks had been asking me for this for some time. My reason for not doing this earlier was that azithromycin itself is an antibacterial. It is not an antiviral. So I thought that for COVID context, that medicine did not make sense. However, because of the studies, it does make sense. So today I'm going to talk about this. Another exciting news is that tomorrow we'll have uh, Cytodine's, Cytodyne's CEO, Dr. Porterson, with us at 6 o'clock. So in this discussion tomorrow, they will be present as well. So that would be an amazing thing. Thank you very much. I have been asking you for the questions that you want to ask him and we have I've gotten tons of tweets with the questions and I've gotten a lots of Facebook messages as well. So anybody here on YouTube, if you would like to ask some questions tomorrow, please uh, come in and ask the questions here or leave them in the comment here and I would curate them. So with this, let's start our discussion. So there's a comment from Shelly that, hi, Doc, I sent your site over to a group of long haulers. As you know, I, I'm unfortunately part of the group. I'm very sorry about that. Please tell me uh, maybe separately in the comments or tweet to me that how are you managing it? I have seen some uh, management that can be done easily, but I'm seeing that it depends upon the doctor as well. And it also depends why a person ended up as a long hauler. So uh, I hope that you recover fast and soon. Let us start our discussion for today. So we are going to talk about the macrolides. <clears throat> so the azithromycin is a class of drug which is called, these are natural, natural substances and these are called macrolides. The class here or these drugs here include erythromycin. Erythromycin was the very first drug in this class that was discovered and then azithromycin, clarithromycin, and nowadays a more recent one, telithromycin. These drugs, macrolides, they are macrocyclic lactones. So they are macrocyclic lactones. What does that mean? Macrocyclic compounds are those chemical compounds that have a ring structure, but their ring has 12 or more membered uh, components in it. So the ring is large ring. And lactones are cyclic carboxylic carboxylic esters. So they are the carboxylic acid esters. This is a general skeleton of the azithromycin. It has, this is the macrocyclic component in it. And with this, so if you see here, plus deoxyribose, uh, deoxy sugars. So remember that we talk about that deoxyribonucleic acid or oxy oxy sugars. So deoxy sugars attached to it. So here is the macrocyclic component. And these two boat-like structures are deoxy sugars. So this structure together, all of this together is a macrolide. And in this case, this is an azithromycin. I would also like us that because I, I made this plus over here, that this is the, the drugs are macrocyclic lactones plus one or more deoxy sugars. And I put the plus over here. Keep this in your mind because these drugs primarily also work on the gram positive bacteria. So these are bacteriostatic drugs. And I'll explain what does that mean. But please remember, keep in your mind gram positive pathogen. Here is a small example 
of what is a deoxy sugar. So here, this is ribose. This is not a deoxy sugar. This is a ribose with a hydroxyl group over here. And that group, hydroxyl group here is removed and replaced with a hydrogen atom. And that produces a deoxy ribose. The drug, so azithromycin or, or the macrolides, they are usually used in upper respiratory tract infections. They can be used in pneumonia as well. They're used for some STDs as well. And they're used for a number of other conditions. So for example, strep throat, staphylococcal aureus infections, pneumococci that cause pneumo, uh, pneumonia, plus they cause meningitis, plus they cause otitis media or the middle ear, ear infection, enterococci that are for the uh, 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 GIT, legionella, pneumophila, mycoplasma. Th this is very commonly used for uh, mycoplasma infections. Mycobacteria, some rickettsia or rickettsia, and then chlamydia and some other sexually transmitted uh, diseases as well. So uh, there is a question that can azithromycin be taken as a prophylaxis? The answer is no. So azithromycin alone is not very useful uh, other than for the secondary infections during the COVID. Plus it does not have a long enough half-life to be able to provide prophylaxis. Plus it is an antibiotic and taking it again and again can actually cause resistance. So it is not a good drug for pro prophylaxis. The best drug so far that I'm seeing for the prophylaxis are hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Again, I keep saying with the ivermectin, do not give it to the pregnant women or lactating women or people with meningitis. And for the hydroxychloroquine, people with retinal issues, heart issues, or G6PD deficiencies, they should not take that. And generally, this is not a prescription here for anyone. These drugs should be only taken with your doctor's advice. Continuing, so to understand how does this drug work, how do macrolides work, I have put a bacteria here. This cute little bacteria is actually very dangerous. This is a pneumococcus, or this is the uh, bacteria that causes pneumonia. It is also called diplococcus because two of them live together. So if you see here, this is one pathogen, and this one is another pathogen above. So they both are coupled together and they both live together. This is why they're called diplococcus. They are rounded. Cocci means rounded structures, and diplo means double. So they, are, they live in pairs, and they are rounded in structure. Then if you see here, diplococcus or pneumococcus normally are capsulated. I'm not going to go over all the pathogens. Just wanted to kind of create a little bit of a context here. The diplococcus or pneumococcus has a capsule on it. The capsule is actually something that helps the pathogen evade phagocytosis. Remember, we've been talking about the macrophage and the macrophage is present and the macrophage would eat up the coronavirus. When a macrophage would try to eat a pneumococcus, so let's say here is the macrophage, and when it is trying to eat a pneumococcus, this is a bacteria, the bacteria has a capsule on it. That capsule makes the bacteria slippery and macrophage cannot really eat it with that much of an ease. That is how this bacteria tries to evade the macrophages. This is why this bacteria, pneumococcus, is usually filtered in the spleen. When it passes, when the blood passes through the spleen and the pathogen goes there, it is the spleen sinusoids and the macrophages there that capture it and remove it. This is also why people who have splenectomy because of uh, maybe accidents or because of sickle cell disease, they need to have the vaccination to the pneumococcus and the antibiotics to it. This pathogen, the um, pneumococcus, also is catalase negative. So you know that I love cats. And this pathogen is catalase negative. It doesn't have a cat, so it doesn't like cats. It is a gram-positive pathogen as well. So this purple color that I made is for the gram-positive. And remember that for just side note that the uh, the vaccine that we make for the pneumococcus are basically targeted at the antigens present in the pneumococcal uh, capsules. This pathogen has a couple of enzymes in it. One is called IgAs, protease, and the other one is called pneumolysin. Through these uh, enzymes, what it does is uh, IgA is an antibody that lives in our mucous membranes. For example, let's say we are infected by coronavirus 
And if that infection occurs and our body produces antibodies, the IgA antibody that will be produced will go and start living in all the wet surfaces of our body. And that is when the coronavirus would appear or attack again in the mucous membranes, the antibodies would quickly catch it and remove it or neutralize it. So uh, this pathogen, pneumococcus, actually has an IgA protease. So it has a hammer of its own. So when it comes into our body and goes into the wet surfaces and there is an IgA against it, it actually breaks that IgA down through the IgA protease. So it actually breaks down our, our defenses. Similarly, it has pneumolysin. That is another enzyme that causes tissue destruction. Now, please remember that um, the macrolides have limited gram negative activity. So they can actually be active against Bortella, pertussis, and Haemophilus influenza, but they do not have a very wide range of activity against uh, gram negative. One more thing that is interesting to note that macrolides like azithromycin are actually wider spectrum than penicillins, number one. Number two, they are very efficacious and mostly very safe. That is why when somebody has penicillin uh, allergies, they can be given macrolides as a substitute, as a replacement. So continuing on with our discussion, I want to make sure that we understand the mechanism of action of azithromycin. So here is a bacterial structure. So this bacteria, if you see from outside inwards, so outside this, um, this orange thing is the bacterial capsule. Then the black wall is the bacterial cell wall then inside of that so imagine these are like russian dolls so outside is the orange doll and that is a capsule then within the orange doll is a black doll and that is a cell wall within the black doll is another blue doll over here that i've made and that is this cytoplasmic membrane and then within that black blue do doll everything it is filled with fluids and dna and the food vacuoles and the ribosomes for the bacteria. So this green thing that you're seeing, this is the jelly-like cytoplasm inside a bacteria. In that cytoplasm, bacteria has its own DNA present in it. So this big chromosome, this rope-like structure that I've made here, that is the bacterial DNA. Usually it is in the form of a circle, but then it is kind of a twisted rope-like thing, which if you open it up, it would make a circle. And then there are tiny other DNA um, circles present as well. These are called plasmids. Bacteria actually share, bacteria are very, very social as well with each other. So what they do is that they take plasmids. Plasmids are usually extra DNA present in them that helps them make enzymes that can, for example, give them um, uh, antibiotic resistance. So one bacteria is, let's say there is a bacteria pneumococcus. It has learned to become resistant to, let's say, azithromycin. It would have a, how would it become resistant? It would develop or acquire this plasmid or DNA, piece of DNA, which would allow it to have an, an enzyme that can beat azithromycin. And then bacteria are so social, they can connect with each other and then share the copies of that plasmid to give the resistance to other bacteria. So they share the information with each other and they make each other capable of handling antibiotics and other things. So these plasmids are actually acquired pieces of DNA that give bacteria special powers. So now continuing on, this is the most important part. This is the hero of our discussion today. This is bacterial ribosome. Ribosomes, we have been discussing about them from the very beginning of our discussions. Ribosomes are small machineries inside the cells. We have them as well, and bacteria have them as well. And these ribosomes can take a piece of genetic material, for example, uh, the RNA, and they can make proteins from it. So our protein that we make in our body are actually made by ribosomes. Bacteria have these proteins as well. So let's look at that bacterial ribosome a little bit more closely. So let's say that this is a bacteria. This I have taken out the ribosome. So look at this little guy over here. We have taken that guy out and separately drawn it over here. Now, bacterial cells or bacteria themselves are called prokaryotes. And our cells are called eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are the cells that are truly cell 
they are real cells. They have a nucleus in a pocket and then they have cytoplasm and they have a cell membrane. Bacteria do not have a nucleus separately. Remember over here, if you see, nucleus is just floating around in the cytoplasm. So bacteria are not really very well-structured cells. So because of that, we say that they were one step before a cell. They're not as mature as a cell. So we call them prokaryotes or before the cell. So what we did was, lucky for us, that the ribosome, the protein-making machine, the, um, the tailor inside a, inside a cell or inside a bacteria that helps it make proteins, their ribosome is different from our ribosome. So I've made our ribosome or eukaryotic ribosome over here. Our ribosome here, ribosome is normally split into two pieces. We call them a bigger part and a smaller part. So here, if you can see, our ribosome has a 60S subunit and a 40S subunit. And what does this mean, the S subunit? So first of all, S stands for Swedberg unit. So I hope that I'm pronouncing it correctly. And what happens is, if you take the ribosome and put it in a centrifuge tube, and then you centrifuge it, what would happen is various parts of the ribosome would gravitate towards the bottom as you are spinning the tubes at different rates depending upon their density. So whichever goes farther would be given a, would be lighter and whichever stays, uh, sorry, whichever goes farther would be heavier and whichever stays early in the tube is lighter. So based on that, we kind of figure out that which part of the ribosome is uh, heavy and which part is not heavy. And this is done for many other things as well, not just the ribosome. So here our bodies or our cells ribosomes are 60S and 40S. We Overall, they're called 80S subunits or, or ribosomes. On the other hand, a bacteria's ribosome is 70S. It has a 30S subunit and a 50S subunit. And because of this difference between our ribosome and bacterial ribosome, we can make antibiotics that would only target bacterial ribosome and not us or not our ribosome. This is why when we give macrolides, macrolides would go and attack bacterial ribosome, but they would not attack our ribosomes. So here what, what happens is if you can see this little macrolide sticking to the 50S subunit, so it, it basically attaches to the P part. There is a P um, location in the 50S subunit and it goes and attaches there. Important thing, the important takeaway is that this ribosome its function is to make protein. So if you see here, this blue thread, that is the RNA. RNA is inserted into the ribosome and that template of the RNA passes through the ribosome. And as it is passing through it, the bacteria would create a protein thread. So if you see here, this blue, this blackish part is a protein thread. That protein thread, once it has become built, it would then further become folded and become an enzyme or other components of the bacteria. So what if we, if we disrupted the bacterial ribosomal function, then what would happen is this bacteria would live. However, this bacteria cannot make more proteins which are needed to make copies of the bacteria. So bacterial replication will stop, but the bacteria to which this drug is attached that bacteria will not die. Because of this, we say that this, these kind of drugs that disrupt further division, but do not kill the bacteria, these are called bacteria, bacteria static drugs. They make them static, they make them stop. They are not bactericidal, they do not kill them, they just stop them from multiplying further. So if you see here, this is our drug that is attached to the 50S subunit and it is disrupting the bacterial ribosome. So this bacteria over here, its ribosome was supposed to make more proteins, which would then be sufficient to make another bacteria from them. And now we have disrupted the ribosome and it, the bacteria would not be able to make more copies of itself. There are other drugs as well, for example, chloramphenicol or tetracyclines that also attack the bacterial ribosome. So it's not just the, these uh, uh, macrolides. Now, here are some interesting things that these macrolides do. And this is, I, I find this a fascinating thing. What they do is, if you see here, all of these cells, 
these are all leukocytes. These are all white blood cells. So if I go from this side, we have neutrophil, then we have an eosinophil, a basophil. That is the name of the cell based on its uh, color properties when we color them. So neutrophil means it doesn't get any color. Eosinophil means it becomes reddish when we um, uh, color them. Basophils take the basophilic um, color. So this is the hematoxylin and eosin dyes. And then lymphocytes, lymphocyte T cell, lymphocyte B cell, and monocyte. Do you know what the tetracy these macrolides do? They sit in these cells. And here is the here is the funny thing. These cells are related to immune system. They are part of the immune system and they're supposed to go to the area of infection and work there. And imagine if the macrolides are sitting in the cell, they would also hitch a ride to the area of infection. This is how they reach the area of infection. They sit down in the infection in, in the uh, immune cells. And when the immune cells go to the area of infection, macrolide reach there as well. Then they find bacteria over there and then they attack the ribosome of the bacteria and stop the bacteria from further division. Isn't that clever? And then there are some more things that are interesting for us to know from a COVID point of view. Look, the macrolide studies have shown that, and this is independent of the ribosomal activity. The studies have shown that they are they suppress neutrophils and lymphocytes. So it is possible that they reduce the runaway immune system. How strong is their suppression is not known. So we can't say just like we have steroids that can suppress the whole immune system. I don't think that azithromycin can be given like a steroid to suppress the whole system, but they do have somewhat a capability of suppressing neutrophils and lymphocytes. So they can calm down the immune response a little bit. Similarly, they can down-regulate natural killer cells. So here is a study, effect of azithromycin on natural killer cell function. And we have talked about the natural killer cells before. I'm just going to very quickly review it. What happens is that imagine this is a epithelial cell, a lung cell. And imagine that in this cell is the coronavirus. And the coronavirus has hijacked this cell's machinery and it is making copies of its own self. Because of that, the cell is now sick, right? So this cell is kind of a sick cell. It cannot make its own proteins because coronavirus has taken over the cell's machinery and it is making more coronaviruses. Because of that, the cell will not have the appropriate proteins on its surface. And now here comes a natural killer cell. Natural killer cells were actually part of the acquired arm. They are actually lymphocytes that break away from the lymphocyte, become part of the innate arm. And this is how they work in the innate arm. What they do is when, whenever they come close to, I call them pervert cells, wherever they go, they would touch every cell around them. And that is their function. They, they uh, run around in our body. Every cell they come near, they touch that. And if they see that the cell does not have enough proteins on its surface, which may be because the cell is infected by a bacteria or a virus or a fungus, or the cell has a cancer in it, in all those cases, so let me see if I can make a hand of the natural killer cell over here. So let's say the natural killer cell is touching this cell and it is kind of massaging it and trying to see if the proteins are there. And if the proteins are not there in a sick cell because the virus has hijacked the cell machinery, then the natural killer cell would kill this cell. And they would kill it by the same mecha mechanism like we see with the cytotoxic T cells. And that is they would release perforins that would create holes in the cell. And then they would throw granzymes that would go and tell the cell to die. The NK cells can do these kind of things with all the sick cells that they encounter, virally sick, bacterially sick, fungal sick, or cancerous cells. So I really love NK cell for the function they are doing. They are working in our body all the time, checking every cell, inspecting every cell surface, making sure it is healthy. And if it is not healthy, they remove them. So... Um, Azithromycin or the macrolides can actually downregulate the NK cells. So somebody had asked me this question that is it 
possible that this function of azithromycin is also going to help with the COVID-19. My observation or my studies that we have done, and I've discussed those studies here in the NK cell lecture with the, with the Dr. Bean community here with the cool beans, that actually our problem is that the NK cells are reduced in number in COVID-19. And we need them to be upregulated to be able to have a strong innate arm. So I do not know that the amount of suppression by the azithromycin for the NK cell is dangerous or not. I would believe it is not because it has been used a lot for COVID-19 without any uh, issues by, of increasing the COVID-19 disease severity itself. I have seen that it actually helps reduce it. And finally, one more very important part, and that is that the azithromycin or the macrolide, especially the azithromycin, can actually potentiate the effect of hydroxychloroquine. And this is what was the original Didier study that came out, where they had said that when you give hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin, azithromycin potentiates the effect of hydroxychloroquine by five times, I believe. So how does it do that exactly is not known. The, the thing that I would say that I am seeing so many doctors uh, internationally that have stopped using hydroxychloroquine saying that WHO says don't use it, but they continue to use azithromycin. Azithromycin alone can be a bacteriostatic as we are seeing, may be used for secondary infections, but I believe azithromycin alone has not much to do with the COVID-19. That is just a placebo effect that they are using. Finally, the last part of our discussion today, azithromycin is a cheap drug. It's about $4 for one course for treatment. It can help with the middle ear infections or otitis media, strep throat, pneumonia, traveler's diarrhea, sexually transmitted diseases, even malaria. The side effects, and most of the time this is very safe drug, side effects usually occur to 1% or lesser uh, number of people. Still, as a medical community, we should know what are the side effects. So they can cause the most common side effects are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. That occurs in about 5% of the people. Allergic reaction can occur. QT prolongation. This is what is important for all of us medical professionals to keep in mind. QT prolongation is done by azithromycin. QT prolongation is done by hydroxychloroquine as well. So when we give them in a combination, they can become dangerous for patients of heart uh, issues. They um, Macrolides have been seen to be safe in pregnancy. However, we are not sure that if they are okay in lactating women, that means um, are they released in the uh, secreted in the uh, in the milk, and then the what is the effect on the baby, or what is the effect on the uh, breasts through which the, it is being secreted? It is not clear that how safe are they in that situation. They can rarely cause hepatitis or deliriums as well. Hepatitis is hepatitis, liver inflammation. Delirium is the state of confusion and fog and and that way. So this is the discussion for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, many people had, so there is one more topic now related to the same thing and that is doxycycline. People have been asking the cool beans, have been asking me for the doxycycline as well. We will do that. Tomorrow we will meet the CEO of Cytodine and we'll, Cytodyne and we'll see what, what is going on there. Uh, next week, I was going to propose something here. Maybe every Friday or Saturday, we should have open forum and we would announce we will take the questions before the forum. Maybe questions come to me via tweet or they are written down here in the comments. And then we curate the questions and the most frequently asked questions are those that we answer in the open forum, which could be on Friday or Saturday. So please give me your comments that what do you think about that? And then we'll go from there. So I hope that in the meantime, you are keeping yourself safe, healthy and and blessed and i hope that we have a lots of content here that has been useful my request to you please help me as well and that is that please subscribe like and share i'm hearing a lot that when my videos are shared nowadays on facebook facebook actually blocks them saying that these video this video content is against the community policy and it can cause harm 
I do not know how it can cause harm by knowing more about medical mechanisms. But anyways, nowadays, Facebook has started blocking as well. With this all, please like, subscribe and share. And I'll see you tomorrow. We'll have the CEO of Dr. Uh, Cytodyne with us. We'll talk about Lironly Map. Thank you. Love you all. Stay safe. Stay happy. Stay blessed.